The long-running web series Think Tech Hawaii started as a talk show here on Hawaii Public Radio many moons ago. It then expanded its horizon, adding a video component, morphing into broadcasting online. We invited host Jay Fardell to talk about the show's early beginnings and the decision to cut production at the end of this month, a result of funding challenges. Fidel chuckles as he recalled his favorite show on public radio was one where he explored nuclear power in Russia, which caught the attention of then HPR general manager Michael Titterton. My favorite show was about fallen Russian nuclear scientists. Okay, there'd been a little press about some fellow out of Milwaukee, I think, who was a, a, a sportsman, a sports athlete at one of the universities in that state. And he went to Russia and he opened a pizza parlor because he liked pizza. In Siberia, he opened the parlor and the people loved it. The Russians loved pizza. So he was making money in this numbered city. I mean, my numbered city it had no name. It only had a number, and it had a number because the university in that city only did nuclear physics. And that was what Stalin wanted, and that was what the administration in Russia wanted going forward. So <clears throat> this guy was making money in multiple cities in Russia. And I heard about that on National Public Radio. You know National Public mm -hmm. Radio. Yes, we do. And I, I was really enlightened. It was like opening my mind. Wait a minute. Why can't we talk to somebody in Russia right here from this studio where you and I are sitting? So I found somebody who was an R&R &R who had been in the State Department, who had been the American consul in Vladivostok. Notice it's pronounced Vladivostok, I, I found out. Okay, her name was Pamela Spratlin. And Pamela sat in that chair... Okay, Impressive. and the other people in the show were in Vladivostok. It was the president of the Foreign State Technical University in Vladivostok. And then we had somebody in Washington who was with an NGO that gave money to former nuclear scientists in Russia from those numbered cities. And then Pamela said, you can't have a show about Russia without having a Russian poet because poetry is essential to understanding Russia. So we found a Russian teacher, a poet, a literature teacher in the University of Washington, okay, and we had all of us on the show at the same time. I was here, Pamela was there, the guy in Washington was in Washington, president of the Festu, it was called, was in Vladivostok, and the poet was in the state of Washington. It was a wonderful show because we explored things you never knew. We found that there were, in fact, scientists out there who were dangerous because they knew about nuclear energy and bombs. And we found this guy in Washington who was paying them mm, to do the right thing. <laughs> it was just an amazing show. In the middle of the show, Michael Titterton walks up to that window Okay, it was the second time in eight years that Michael Titterton had come up to the window, and usually he didn't do that. Usually, if you saw Michael Titterton's face at that window, you knew something was wrong. <laughs> okay, in fact, okay, this was on the on the evening of a of a fun drive, an HPR fun drive, and we were tying up three long distance lines for almost an hour, and Michael was concerned. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Anyway, that was a, that was my favorite show. Okay. So tell us about then your life after Hawaii Public Radio, because that's coming to a close, too. After I left, I started doing uh, shows in my law office with, um, you know, the, the equipment, the technology had, had moved on, had improved, and we could do that. And I started writing for the Honolulu Advertiser, and I wrote for them for and the Star Advertiser for several years. I had a column there. And uh, ultimately, we got in with uh, AM radio at Salem Radio uh, in Kalihi, and we had a regular studio there. And we did that. Actually, we did that until we developed our own studio in Pioneer Plaza. And then we connected our studio with Salem, and we would have video on our in our studio and we would have audio through Salem same production two distributions it was really fabulous okay and we we stayed at Pioneer Plaza for several years so how long have you been doing then think tech post hpr 
Well, altogether, Think Tech is almost 25 years old. 25 years yeah. old. Okay. I know I don't look like that. I, <laughs> I, I couldn't possibly have been doing this for 25 years, but there you have it. And so, gosh, so, so yeah, another chapter, another page? Oh, uh, yeah. <clears throat> so the technology moved on, you know, uh -huh. and uh, not kidding that our middle name was Tech. And the Tech was not necessarily that we were covering every aspect of the Tech industry, although I have to say that politically we were covering Act 221 and the development of Ed Cadman's Tech Campus, Biotech Campus that he wanted to do in Kaka'ako. We covered Kaka'ako a lot. In fact, we had T-shirts that said, Breakfast in Kaka'ako. And Ed Cadman, the dean of the medical school, as it worked out, wore one of those shirts. Mm -hmm. The Think Tech, breakfast in Kaka'ako. Anyway, we covered tech as much as we could. Linda Lingle undid Act 221. And by 2010, um, you know, there really was no Act 221. And a lot of the tech people who had come here for the benefits of Act 221 left. Okay, so that was the kind of the end of a phase. But in the meantime, we were going farther and wider, and we were using more tech. We had moved into a larger studio in Pioneer Plaza. We had a control room like that one right there uh, with the window, glass mm -hmm. window. Every control room has to have a glass window. And, uh, and the studio was just soundproofed and had multiple cameras and mics and a big table, a carefully designed studio. And we broadcast, you know, dozens of shows every week. Ultimately, it was more than 30 half-hour talk shows on video, on the internet every week. And we did that for several years until 2020, when we moved into Finance Factors building, Finance Factors Center, and also on, on Bishop Street with a smaller studio because we really didn't need with the control room and we didn't need all the video equipment we had accumulated. The technology had moved on. It didn't take as much space and so forth. So we began broadcasting in a smaller space in 1164 Bishop. And since then, we have found that we don't even need a studio. All we need is a tech place with computers and advanced software and systems that allow us to stream everywhere in the world. So we're getting shows from everywhere and we're streaming everywhere. And we have a very active website and YouTube channel and multiple social media channels. And that's what we got to be doing. And we, we learned all the software that could service us. And we made a lot of video with it. And we disseminated it into many places. And we had shows both coming and going in Latin America, Africa, Middle East, Asia, Europe, mainland, Canada, I think I got it all. Okay. And, and we had regular, regular uh, conversations with people in all those places, and they uh, promoted the, those shows, and, and people were listening for all around the world. And so you made a decision, though, to close the curtain at the end of the month? Well, yeah. Our business model, Catherine, has been to raise money through underwriters, all of whom gave us a few thousand dollars. And... When you tallied them all up, it was enough to pay our budget. And our budget, you know, with rent and staff. Carol Monley and I were the managers. We never took any compensation. But we had to pay staff. We had to pay for that software. We had to pay for that equipment. We had to pay for a lot of things. And the cost of running a studio, as you mentioned, it's, it's expensive. And so we relied on our underwriters and fund drives, sort of like your fund drives, mm -hmm. but way smaller, to pay the freight. But it, it came to pass, and, and COVID had something to do with this, where a lot of our underwriters and our donors were really not, you know, uh, kicking in the way they used to. And it was a bunch of reasons, not one reason. I mean, some of them got sick, some of them died. Some of them did dementia for us. Some of them went out of business or went bankrupt uh, or left town and couldn't care. And so the result is that our fundraising became less and less, and it was not enough. It was not sufficient. That's what we concluded early this year. It was not sufficient for us to actually continue to do what we had designed. And so uh, what's the plan going forward? We're continuing right now, as you and I speak, to do our regular lineup, which is roughly 30 shows a week. And our studio is alive and well. Our at the end of April, we're going to cut back on that, and we're going to give up the space that we have had at 1164 Bishop. 
and we're going to take it ad hoc. What I mean by that is that if something comes our way, yes, we will put it through our, our process and we will post it on YouTube and, and play it on our stream, but it won't be 30 shows a week. There'll be commentaries and you know special events and special discussions about news that is very timely. And we're also developing a legacy program. This is important. Because remember, I said we have really focused on the, on the technology and especially in recent years on the AI. So we're building legacy collection program that is going to be able to reach back to all the shows we've ever done. And the ones we have are roughly 16,000 shows. And we're going to make them all searchable with the idea that somebody might want to know who was around, you know, 10 years ago. Who is saying what 10 years ago about political, social issues here on the mainland and around the world? What was happening? So it's, it's a research tool we're going to build for anyone to look at our particular contribution to the news and to the media and to the public conversation. We have been hearing from the colorful and exuberant Jay Fidel, who first hosted a show called Think Tech Kauai here on Hawaii Public Radio in 2001. He quickly embraced video and the Internet, and his shows can still be found online. Uh, Fidel announced he is cutting production at the end of April and will focus on creating an archive of shows.